Let me introduce Stefano, uh, with, who will talk about uh, monetization of data. Oh, we are surprisingly on time. <laughs> yes. Um, can I go? Yeah. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stefano Cucchiella. I'm the CTO and co founder of Canarybit. And Canarybit is basically a startup we founded like, just before the pandemic, actually, like a week before the pandemic struck Sweden. Um, and, uh, and we are a cloud security plus company in the sense of we see security as a, as a, as a mean to actually then uh, embrace new business and, and bring new business to an organization, not just to secure your, uh, your system uh, and your environment. So today I would like to talk about the demonization, probably something that is like 10 years from now, five years from now, depends how the nuclear plants will go, probably. <laughs> and, um, but to do that, I just want to roll back to the 14th century first. Because this is what basically back at school in Italy, uh, we used to learn, um, uh, or basically read uh, in that case. And, and this is basically the uh, divine comedy from Dante Alighieri. And in this uh, novel, basically, the novel in general begins with the, uh, with the story that Dante finds himself in this dark woods and lost in this dark woods. And I feel like this is kind of what the organizations are feeling today, kind of. There is so much technology around them, so many regulations around them, so many, uh, let's say, uh, thing to think about to actually generate new business that they kind of feel like, okay, where am I now? Like, what's the right path for me to then generate value? And the funny thing here is like the, the, this part of the book was actually called Inferno, that in English literally means hell. <laughs> and it's basically probably like, that's the, what the, most of the organizations feel uh, like today. But in general, organizations today are openly, sh openly share the, the, the digital assets. It can be data, it can be algorithms, to simply generate new, um, new value for, for, for the organization itself uh, and, and bring new, new revenue. Uh, they do this with the partners because they need their partners, of course, to, 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 to collaborate with and, and to bring the, the organization forward. But what are actually the risks? At what cost are we doing this? So first of all, it's, uh, we have security risks of doing this. Um, to basically like let someone else get access to your digital assets. It can be your data, it can be your uh, model. Um, we have legal issues in this case, because by doing so, you might even lose your intellectual property, uh, your IP on the asset that you're actually sharing with someone else. Or at the same time, we might have a societal issue. It depends on the domain and the space that you work in. Think about all the mission critical domains where you, if something happens to your data or you, to your application, that might have a bigger impact on the society, for example. And our question was always like, okay, but can we actually remove some of this risk or can at least mitigate some of this? Well, yes, in a way. Uh, there are basically today new technologies that allow you to basically protect these digital assets. Uh, here are listed just a few and but the problem with these technologies is that they are a bit fragile in the sense of they don't really work with legacy systems uh, it's very hard to adopt them if you have already like a legacy system uh, uh, running and at the same time they don't um, they don't um, they, they, it, it's and for example they don't work with the for example, when it comes to data formats, they don't work with all the kind of formats of data that you expose to your, for example, to your third partner in this case. But they are great, they're great solutions, but it's just that they have some bit limitations and sometimes you might need to adopt a few of them to actually generate some, or really have the benefit of, of, of these price enhancing technologies. Uh, then of course, there is also the compliance part that can help us with all this. So. Since we, today we are here at Volvo Hallen, I, I looked into the uh, automotive industry and these are just few of the European regulations that uh, industry, the automotive industry needs to look into. And on top of this, you also might have potentially some national provisions. 
uh, that might force you not to, for example, exchange or bring the model out for a specific country when you do uh, data inference uh, of, of a specific uh, of, of a specific data set, for example. And on top of that, nowadays we also have the SG um, regulations where that basically expose the organizations to uh, provide more and more information about the um, about the systems that they build for sustainability purposes. Think about, for example, the uh, battery producer, uh, producers, for example. Today, they are required to ex expose more information about the batteries for sustainability reasons, but then at the same time, exposing this data can also be you know, exposing some of your core business, some information about your core business. So there is always, we need to find a trade-off in this case to actually work with, with regulations as well. But in general, I'd say these are, this is another tool, regulations are another tool in general to, to, to protect your data and to secure your data set. So, but in general then, what can we really do today? So we, first of all, we are kind of a bit, we focus a lot on protecting these digital assets from the technology point of view, and trying to fulfill all the regulations that we have uh, just described up there. So we know today, normal scenario, that how to protect data at rest. Uh, we talk about uh, object storage. We know how to protect data when it's in an object storage uh, and so on. We know how to protect data when it's transit. But what about then when the data is actually used, is actually running on a specific machine on a specific server. Until yesterday, basically, the, uh, the, <laughs> this was quite open to everyone uh, managing that specific server. But today, instead, there is a new technology that is called confidential computing that allows you to protect the, work, the running workloads and at the same time have a pure attestation report of the environment that, that runs the workload. And this, Confidential computing technology is, is, a, is a technology that basically allows to you to protect the memory, to encrypt the memory of the server that, where your workload runs upon. And this is a technology that today is provided uh, by the main uh, chip vendors like AMD ARM. And as you see, like, uh, there is also NVIDIA there because even NVIDIA is coming today with their confidential AI and confidential GPU. I saw Mark and that he had like NVIDIA H100, uh, uh, basically in his slides and in just next to the nuclear plant. And that's probably what is gonna happen <laughs> because we try, we play with this stuff. And I can tell you that three days of full run of this environment, it basically costs us like $6,000 just for six, uh, for just for three days. So it's, it's quite expensive. And, uh, and I can also imagine like at the same time, it requires quite a lot of energy. Um, okay, here the slides got a bit mixed up. Uh, but, but at the same time, there is also quite a lot of um, support from at infrastructure level. So today we have, as I said, like at the physical level, we have all the confidential CPU, GPU, uh, and networks, there is also today like a way to verify what is your network provider, to be honest. Uh, there, there, is a, oh, there is an ongoing work to also enable that. And on top of that, then we have the virtualization layer where you can start spinning up what is called the confidential VMs. And, and then on top of that, we can start playing with containers that everyone likes today, loves today. <laughs> it's up to you to decide if you want to go for it. But we play a lot, we played a lot with confidential containers, but we realized that today these are not uh, really aligned with what we do. Um, and we took a step back and we started to work now with Kata containers instead, where we uh, integrate Kata containers with our uh, uh, attestation service, which is basically the service that allows you to verify that the the host, the physical machine that the cloud provider provides you is actually a machine that has the confidential computing capability enabled. So you can, you're always sure that at least the memory of that specific server is always encrypted and your workload is secure. Then we also have an orchestration service that basically allows you to deploy the full stack on the selected uh, infrastructure. So, then when it comes then going back to the main topic of data uh, monetization, the second 
focus that we need to look into is mainly about data governance, and this is mainly inside an organization. It's something that an organization, organization needs to look into. And as also Gardner says, 80% of organizations will fail to scale if they lack of a modern approach for data governance. So we, data governance, governance nowadays is becoming a kind of a, a pillar in how the organization run their business because pretty much nowadays is becoming like a software company and all organizations, they are collecting so many data that they need to actually have a clear understanding on what data they have, what format, what value they can generate out of that data. And data governance is what usually helps you with. with, with. Um, and these are, for example, just a few of the benefits that they, data governance uh, gives you without going into much into the details, but this is basically like what data governance can bring uh, as a benefit to the organization. Uh, third step instead is to actually, to enable data organization is to build data products. So once we collect all the data um, from whatever these devices and, and so on, then we need to basically not only sell the raw data, like for example, MasterCard does today. That's, yes, it works, but if I give you my raw data, what are you gonna do with that? You don't know what is the, the format of my data. You don't even know what that data actually contains. While instead, we need to focus on building what are the data products and that are easy to integrate with your, potentially with a third party uh, solution that is that's secure or that they actually doesn't, don't contain kind of too like business critical information from the point of view, from the organization point of view. Of course, they are valuable for a third party. So you need to, as a third party that wants to use this data set, for example, obtain a value or generate some value from this, from this data. And uh, uh, traceable, of course, and reliable. Um, so you need to always make sure that you have the data set available. And uh, first step then on this uh, data monetization process is basically then to enable business to business collaboration. So now we know how to protect the data on one side, we know how to basically, the, the organization should be kind of ready to start exposing their data set in a, in a, in a, in a data product format after they've done some data governance work behind that. So now the, the next step would be basically like, okay, I now need to find a partner that actually wants to use my data. And that's why like, we need more and more B2B collaborations. We have nowadays some of the, uh, some tools already available out there, uh, like uh, Databricks out there, everyone knows, probably all many knows about that, like how you can bring your data uh, into, into one repo and then have a marketplace of data from their point of view. But what we are doing is that I can repeat is to then also use the tools that I mentioned earlier, like confidential computing to create such environments uh, for, for, for the end users and then generate, have, have, have them, sorry, have them available to the end user, have the data sets and the applications available to the end users so that then they can start this collaboration and generate new value for the organization. And, and, and this can be also used inside a, a single uh, organization, doesn't need to be always a third party, especially if you think about large organizations where they have multiple divisions, you might also think that each division works as a single, uh, as a single company in a way, and, and they might need to actually exchange data uh, between, between them. Uh, and we know this is kind of a bit like futuristic in a way because nowadays we are still thinking about how to solve like probably yesterday's problems instead of looking into tomorrow's problems. But for us, this is just the beginning uh, basically. So this is, uh, it, it's a pillar to, to actually start generating new value, new revenue for the, for the, for the organizations also because like if the, 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 the bills are gonna be so expensive because you need the nuclear power to run an AI model or AI uh, uh, machine learning model, then I'm wondering like, okay, wh what are gonna be the bills on, on, the, on the organization sides when it comes to AI? 
from that point of view. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, once again, my name is Stefano Cucchiella, Canary Bit, and uh, if you have any question, more welcome to answer them. Thank you. Which one works? Yeah, which yeah. one doesn't? <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Stefano. Uh, any questions, by the way? I'd like to throw that around. So if you <laughs> please have something to address. Uh, then I have a question about okay, the yeah, data sure. products. We're, we're on embarking on a pretty, pretty interesting journey at Volvo Cars about data products. And we have a data strategy that dictates, depicts, I shouldn't say, not dictates, depicts where we need to be in the future. Mm -hmm. So how do you work with, I mean, if, if you're a super small organization, it's pretty easy to kind of set up and then you have the infrastructure, et cetera. But what are the key considerations when you go into a large organization like Volvo Cars? Obviously, it's impossible to you to answer how yeah. we work, yeah. but in a large organization where you have a, a lot of federation, a lot of different cultures around, a lot of different aspects in terms of technology, yeah. as uh, Johannes and team alluded to, we have traditional IT versus uh, engineering, etc. Yeah. Super hard question. I understand yeah. that. No, but I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think the main again, it goes data product goes back to data governance first. So you first need to have a, a good data governance, governance in the case to actually enable to, 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 to collect the data that you have probably in different systems, as you said, like it's a hundred years old organization. So it's like, you probably have data, I don't know like where, and I cannot even imagine where you have that kind of data, for example. Uh, but you need to first work, <laughs> you need to first work uh, uh, on that side. Uh, and once you have a good, kind of good understanding on how to work with the, with the data that you have, that you collected, that you refined, that you cleaned, and so on, and, and you have a proper process around it, because it's not all about like, collecting data, making sure that it's, okay, it's, uh, it's, it's clean, okay, but then data gets updated every, every time, especially like in, uh, in, uh, in automotive or in any IoT company, for, for example. So you need to have a proper process behind, and then once you, you have a cl clear understanding on that, then it's like, okay, then uh, I have the data, I have the raw data, I need to then start creating a data product then. That's the second step, where you say like, okay, with this kind of data, with this subset of data, I can offer, for example, this service to, for example, an insurance company, like, for example, in the automotive industry, like how, you know, like if you wanna, um, um, kind of understand the driver's behavior, for example, like how do you then, or, or you can potentially then have the data towards an insurance company so that the insurance company can go back to the driver and say, look, this is actually the insurance that fits you best in this case. So it's a, it's a few steps kind of process, and it's a long process, it's complicated because I mean, it's, it's as I mentioned, like data formats are totally different in different organizations. Even if you use the same kind of uh, kind of process in, in one side of the division in, to another side of the division, probably you get different data formats at the same time because they work in different ways. It's as simple as that. So we just need to kind of try to find a way to, to, to build this data product so that easy to integrate, as I mentioned, uh, and that's kind of the key, the key part. We need to this kind of integration uh, available. Yes. Nice. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, what's the biggest uh, uh, hurdle or problem you need to tackle when, when doing this? Is it the legal requirements on data or, or what's the... It depends on the data that you want to collect, that you want to use in that case. Because, I mean, as I said, like customer's behavior or driver's behavior can hit all these regulations over there uh, that I mentioned. Uh, if you try to collect, I don't know, uh, the, the car's specific um, uh, data from, for example, you want to train a machine learning model, as I mentioned, in a different country. Let's say in, we, we play with like China, for example, you want to do that. China doesn't allow you to actually even, the data that is actually collected from, the information that is actually collected from data inference, it doesn't, they don't want to, you to export it to Europe, but you at the same time want to, want to use that kind of knowledge that, that the, the, the model has. And the, the, these are all the, say, uh, 
kind of implications that you need to think about before actually start collecting data and trying to plan how to then use the data and for what purpose, basically. Yes. Good. Uh, thank you, yes. Stefano. Thank you. Uh, and then we have.